Good afternoon, folks. It's good to see you. Welcome to the last day of August. Can you believe it? Kids are back to school, and uh, the weather is today definitely a little bit cooler. Um, so I'm excited about uh, uh, getting into this next uh, book of the Bible with you. Uh, we are looking at the book of Hosea today. Uh, the book of Hosea is one of those uh, books where you, where you start reading and you're thinking, Wow, God, why did you put this poor guy through this scenario and uh, the uh, the truth is that uh, there's a reason for it and we're going to talk about it a little bit today and I'm just so glad that you're here with us and I would hope that you would share this with somebody that, uh, that needs an encouragement needs to, to see this today and if you haven't uh, liked our Facebook page I encourage you to go ahead and do that but uh, let's open up with a word of prayer and then we'll get right into our video today and uh, I, I think you're going to enjoy it so Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time. Bless this, uh, this talk to our hearts today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, here we go. The book of the prophet Hosea. Hosea lived in the northern kingdom of Israel, which he sometimes calls Ephraim or Jacob, about 200 years after they had broken off from southern Judah. Remember the story from 1 Kings. Hosea was called to speak on God's behalf during the reign of one of Israel's worst kings, Jeroboam II. The nation was descending into chaos, and in the year 722, the big bad Assyrian Empire swooped in and decimated Israel. Again, see the story in 2 Kings. And Hosea had seen all of this coming. The book is a collection of some 25 years of his preaching and writing. It's almost all poetry. And this whole collection has been designed to have three main sections. Let's just dive in and you'll see how it works. The opening part tells the story of Hosea's broken marriage to a woman named Gomer who commits adultery. Now, it's not totally clear whether Gomer slept around with other men before or only after they got married, but they did have three children together and things fell apart. The important point is that God tells Hosea that despite Gomer's unfaithfulness, he is to go find her, to pay off her debts to her lovers, and to commit his love and faithfulness to her once again. And then God says that all of this, the broken and repaired marriage, the children, it's all a prophetic symbol telling the story of God's relationship relationship to Israel. So God has been like a faithful husband to Israel. He rescued them out of slavery. He brought them to Mount Sinai where he entered into a covenant with them. He asked them to be faithful to him alone. But then he brought Israel into the promised land and they took all the abundance that he gave them and they dedicated it to the worship of the Canaanite god Baal. And so God has a legitimate reason. He could end the covenant and divorce Israel and he thinks about doing so but instead he says that he's going to pursue Israel again and and renew his covenant with them. And he says why? It's purely because of his own love, compassion, and faithfulness. Hosea then spells out what all this means. He says the consequences for Israel's rebellion will be imminent defeat by other nations and exile. But there's hope for future restoration. One day Israel will once again repent and come back to worship their God. And Hosea says he will place over them a new messianic king from the line of David who will bring God's blessing. And so this opening section introduces all the main ideas of the book. Israel has rebelled and God's going to bring severe consequences, but God's own covenant love and mercy are more powerful than Israel's sin. And so in the remaining sections of the book, Hosea's poetry explores these themes in more depth. So there are two collections of his accusations and warnings for Israel. And then each of these is concluded by a very hopeful poem about God's mercy and hope for the future. So chapters 4 through 10, Hosea explores the causes and effects of Israel's unfaithfulness. He says numerous times that Israel lacks all knowledge or understanding of God. The Hebrew word to know, which is yada, it's more than just intellectual activity. It describes personal relational knowledge. It's the difference between just knowing about someone and then actually knowing that someone. And God wants Israel to know him like that in a relationship. He wants them to experience his love for them and become the kind of knowledge that transforms their hearts and lives so that they love him in return. And so this is why Hosea is constantly exposing the hypocrisy of Israel's worship. He constantly shows how they're breaking the Ten Commandments, how they're allowing grave injustice in their communities, and then they go to their sacred temples and they offer sacrifices to God like everything is just fine. But it's not fine. 
And not only because of their hypocrisy, but because they're worshipping all of these other gods too. He, he mentions many times their altars to Baal at the cities of Bethel and Gilgal. And not only have they given their allegiance to other gods, Hosea repeatedly accuses Israel for trusting in their political alliances with Egypt and Assyria. So instead of trusting God to protect them, they want to become like these nations and rely solely on military power. And God says it's all going to come crashing down on their heads because in not too long, Assyria will turn on them and come to ravage their lands. In this other section of warning, Hosea gives an ancient Israelite history lesson to show how this family has been unfaithful from the beginning. So he alludes to the patriarch Jacob's lying and treachery. Remember Genesis 27 and 28. He alludes to Israel's rebellion in the wilderness. Remember the book of Numbers. He alludes to their appointment of the corrupt king Saul who led the people into sin and disaster. Remember the stories in 1 Samuel. This is all Hosea's way of saying some things in this family family never change. So what hope does Hosea have? Well, we know from chapter 3 that God's going to do something to save and restore his people. And that's what these two concluding chapters explore. Chapter 11 is beautiful. The poem depicts God as a loving father who raised his son Israel and then shared everything with him. But the son grew up and rebelled and turned on the father, taking advantage of his generosity. And so in this poem, God is emotionally torn apart. One moment he's angry and naturally he says he's going to bring severe consequences. But the next moment he's heartbroken. And then he says that he's moved by his mercy and compassion and he's going to forgive the son that he loves. He says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? My heart churns inside of me. All my compassion is aroused. And so while God did allow Israel to be conquered by Assyria, face the consequences, that's not God's final word. There's still hope. And that's what the last chapter is about. Hosea calls Israel to repent and turn back to their God, but he knows that it won't last because it never has before. And God says that one day he will heal their waywardness and love them freely. God goes on to describe this new healed Israel as a lush tree that will grow deep roots and broad branches and offer shade and fruit to all of the nations. It's an image of God's promise to Abraham, how Israel was to become a blessing to the nations. And God God's saying if that's ever going to happen, it's going to require an act of God's grace and healing power to repair the deep brokenness and sinful selfishness of the human heart so that God's people can receive his love and love him in return. This is what God promises to do. Now after this poem concludes, we find the very last words of the book. They're like an appended note. They're likely from the author who collected Hosea's poetry and now wants to speak to you, the reader, for a second. And he says, who is wise and discerning to understand all of this? In other words, Hosea's poems. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. So the author wants you to know that Hosea's ancient poetry to northern Israel is not locked in the past. It reveals deep truths about God's character and purposes and human nature. And while God should and does bring his justice on human evil, his ultimate purpose, his heart, is to heal and to save his people. And that's what the book of Hosea is all about. Okay, well, um, uh, I hope that was uh, informative. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, the whole, the whole thing with the, the his wife Gomer always kind of stuck in my craw a little bit. I'm like, wow, why we got <laughs> have to allow that guy to go through that uh, that difficult time with his family? But um, God often refers to the relationship between Israel and himself as a marriage. Um, when they were being faithful to him, it was understood that they were uh, this marriage relationship. And then when they were being unfaithful to him and seeking after other, like, other gods, he often referred to it as idolatry. Uh, not idolatry, but as uh, infidelity, uh, as uh, adultery. And um, so this is the relationship that, that we understand that God has with his people. So um, we need to be very careful that we take this thing seriously. Um, and the truth is, if it's that covenant relationship between a man and a wife is the same way in which God dealt with the people of Israel, he had every right to break the covenant 
uh, with them and divorce them. But he didn't. He didn't do that. Um, and one of the key phrases that I think the, uh, the video brought out was that God's covenant love is more powerful than Israel's sin. And uh, that's the same. We can take that to the bank uh, as believers, too. God's uh, love for us is more powerful than our, our sin. And thank, thank the Lord, right? So um, I want to talk about a couple things that uh, uh, we're going to get into some scripture here today in a minute, some New Testament scripture uh, as well. And uh, But one of the things that has often been said about evangelicals and church is that, you know, this concept of a personal God, this relational God, that, that this idea that God wants a, re a personal relationship with his people is is a New Testament concept. And, and that's just not, that's not true. He, he talks about that. Uh, when he breaks on the word yada, um, to know. And, and this word yada is not a word that means uh, knowledge of somebody, like um, looking in a, a magazine and seeing a celebrity and knowing all about the celebrity and, and uh, being obsessed with the celebrity. Um, it's, it's about a personal knowledge, an intimate knowledge of that person, having a personal relationship with with. And that's what God wanted with the people of Israel. He wanted this personal relationship. And that's that's still what he wants. It's what he's wanted since the Garden of Eden. If you have hung in with there with us since the beginning, you notice that that was what God's purpose and plan was. And uh, so this is not a New Testament concept that we're just a bunch of touchy-feely um, uh, people that uh, don't understand the nature of God. I think this is uh, this has always been the way he's wanted it. And uh, and that's the way he wants it for us today. Um, so in chapter 11 of Hosea, he talks about this, uh, this figurative father who has a, uh, has a son and this, this father-son relationship. And as I was reading it and I was looking at it, um, it really uh, it brings to mind another father and son relationship that I think is interesting. Except when, uh, when Jesus talks about this relationship, he puts in another brother. And uh, I want to read that with you. And that's found in Luke chapter 15. And this is the same story. I mean, it's the same relationship uh, that we see in Hosea um, being lived out in the story of the prodigal son. So let's just read it. Isaiah chapter, uh, Luke, excuse me, Luke chapter 15, verse 11, starting there. And it said, and he said, and now this is all written in red. This is all the, 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 the words of Jesus. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Um, not many days later, the youngest son gathered all that he had and took journey into the far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had sp spent everything... A severe famine arose in the country, and began to be, in, and he began to be in need. So he went to and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, who sent him to feed the pigs. And he was lonely to be, uh, excuse me, longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But then he came to himself, and he said, "How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger." I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the and son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servant, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring his uh, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now, this is the concept of, of God uh, uh, in this relationship with his son. The, 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 the son is the wayward son, and, and uh, we understand that the father here is God. And, and the son leaves and is estranged, just like in the book of Hosea, and estranged. And, and I'm sure there was, a, there was a, um, a, a spectrum of emotions that were going through the father. Uh, but by this time, in this story, and this is what Jesus is emphasizing, is that in spite of the son's callousness, in spite of, in spite of the son's sin, in spite of the son's uh, devaluing of this 
intimate relationship with the father. The father is excited to bring this son back into the fold, and uh, and this is the same. This is mirroring the same type of relationship that we see in the book of Hosea. Now Jesus goes a step further, and I'm going to read it to you because um, we're going to talk about it just a little bit at the very end. But he says this in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and he had come and drew near to his house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to com come in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you and have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours come, uh, came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have, all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And that's how this story ends in the book of Luke. Um, it, it, it doesn't have a resolution. There's, we don't know what happens here because we are supposed to answer the question. So we'll get to that in a minute. But this is the this type of relationship that uh, that God has with His people. He loves His people. And he cares for Him. Cares for them desperately. And uh, in His His covenant love is extends beyond uh, the sin of 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 humans. He He. he Look at that story. He runs to us. Uh, when we look to him, he runs to us. So um, then we see in Hosea chapter 14, we talk about relationships with God and Israel being like a tree that will cover and bring healing to the whole world. This is what was supposed to happen. This concept of, of Israel being this, this uh, redemptive agent, the promise of Abraham that the seed of Abraham would, would um, through him would bless the whole world. And, uh, and we have another reference to that, and, and I believe that, um, that Hosea, knowing the scriptures, uh, had this in mind in his Psalm 1. And uh, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. If, if this happens, you know, if that's, if that's what happens, if the relationship is restored, this is what happens. Ready? Number three, uh, verse three. He is like a tree planted by rivers of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither and, uh, and all he does prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked will perish. See, there's this relationship between this, this fountain of life, this, this river of life, um, streams of water, and the prosperity of the tree. Uh, when, when there is an uh, intimate connection between these two things, they flourish. Um, but the wicked are like chaff which the wind drives away. It just dries up. There's no, there's no nourishment. There's no sustenance. So it's, it's talking about this, these interlocking relationships that bring uh, fulfillment and life. And, uh, and it's so important. And then at the end of Hosea chapter 14 verse 9 is that commentary. And, and the question comes, whoever is wise, let him understand that whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the way of the Lord is right and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Okay, so I want to go back to the story of the prodigal son just really quick. Who is righteous at the end of that story? Is the younger brother, the wayward brother, righteous at this point? Is the older brother righteous at this point? Um, I would assert to you today that regardless of the uh, the sins of the younger son, at this point in time, he is considered righteous. Whereas the older brother is unrighteous. In fact, if you look at the book of Hosea at the end there, um, for the ways of the Lord are right and 
the upright walk in them. Okay, way of the Lord. This relationship is restored. The, the, the upright are walking in relationship with God, but transgressors stumble in them. And I feel like the, this older brother is stumbling to understand the, the reason for his faithfulness. His faithfulness is, is really summed up in what the Father can provide him and give him instead of the relationship with the Father. See, he, he goes right to the, you know, when he, when he feels offended, he goes right to, you know, you never even gave me a go. That's not the point. You're with me. You, 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 you've stayed with me. You've been with me. This son has gone away from me, and now he's restored to relationship. See, the, the, we often do this in our Christian walks. We, we see our relationship with God as a, as a means to an end. And I think that's what Israel did, too. That's why they were serving God and also serving the Baals, because they wanted uh, prosperity. They wanted uh, what the gods could provide them instead of the the relationship that comes with the, the fulfillment that comes with knowing God the yada they, they didn't they didn't understand that um, so that they, they were they were duplicitous in their in their worship and I think we are too uh, those of us who have been in the church for a long period of time uh, we have to we have to really evaluate why we would consider ourselves Christ followers. Are we just hanging around with God and staying close because of what we believe He can provide us? Or are we staying close to God so that we can have relationship with Him? So Jesus, at the end of the story, uh, is saying that the Father is begging the older son to come in to the feast and have relationship, uh, relationship not only with him but with his brother. Restore those things. It's all about the relationship. It's not about uh, the wealth of the father or what they can provide. It's about being in the presence of the father. So, just for a matter of value, whoever's wise. If you're wise, who uh, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, are you discerning? Let him know them. The ways of the Lord are right. Do you believe it? He wants relationship with you. He wants, he wants to walk through this life with you. He wants to show you who he is and his ways. And the upright walk in them. Walk side by side. Walk in his ways. Walk with him. And the transgressors, they stumble on this concept. They can't get it. So who are you today? Are you upright? Are you walking with God in relationship with Him? Or are you a transgressor who uh, the, the strenuousness and, the, and, and the, um, the path that God, Jesus wants to walk is causing you to stumble? So I would ask you to evaluate that today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this book of Hosea. God, I thank you that your covenant love is far greater than our infidelity, than our adultery, than our sin. And even though while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And you've, you've sacrificed who you are. You've sacrificed because you love us in spite of our inadequacies, in spite of our sin. So Lord, help us to seek proper relationship with you. Help us not to be a people who just seeks after you as some kind of a uh, a genie in a bottle that we can get things out of. But Lord, help our relationship to be with you be motivated by relationship, by uh, walking uprightly with you in, in a step-by-step a step step manner. And Lord, we want to have yada. We want to not just know about you, but we want to know you. Because that's, that's the perfect purpose of our existence. So be with us. Thank you for the, the example of Hosea. And Lord, I thank you for um, instructing us by your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I hope you have a blessed day. Enjoy your last day in the month of August because it's going to start getting cool now in September. So God bless. We'll see you next week.